the one and only Mr. Russell Crowe, ladies and gentlemen. When I was 17, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small towers and soft summer nights. It was a very good year. You're a lucky number. What do you mean it's my size? This is way too big for me. I'm a medium. Yes, but that suit's very slimming, isn't it? Uh, what is this? What, what company is this? I don't know who this Evening. is. Who, who does this represent? That is uh, the glorious South Sydney rabbit hose. Little bunny. There's a little bunny on there. That's quite pretty. Who've uh, come last in the Australian Rugby League competition <laughs> four times over the last five years. You know, I think my wife might be in for a little treat when I go home and pop this on with just a pair of underpants on. You me. know it. You know it, mate. See, you're going to look manly because it's a rugby jumper, if, for a start. If we did the lights... you a bunny on it. I can go in and pretend I'm you and go, all right, darling. <laughs> guess well, what who, I, what, what guess who Johnny sent home for you this evening? That's right, it's me, the old gladiator, Russell Crowe. What, <laughs> what did I hear the other day? Irish foreplay? <laughs> yeah, what's that? Brace yourself, Colleen, I've been to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Australian foreplay. Three, what's that? You awake? <laughs> Don't encourage him. I like to sneak him while she's still asleep. I find that's easier. <laughs> she barely notices. So does she. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married years now. It's a good arrangement. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, three years ago, you were on the show. God, that's a long time. Seems like a long time, isn't it? It's a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and since then, well, wow, what a busy time we've had. I came back to do the press for Cinderella Man. How come I didn't end up coming? I don't, well, maybe we weren't on, or maybe you decided not to come on the show. I don't know. No, I, I would always come and see you, Jonathan. Okay. You know, well, I would have loved to have had you hold on. You, hold you dear in my heart with well, great affection. Well, bless you. That's really kind of you. Um, now, now, you seem a little bit more mellow. Genuinely, I think that. I'm not just saying that. I mean, you know, you... Because you're... I think you're quite a grumpy it's bloke. It's the hash oil you put in the incense burners back <laughs> yeah. there. George Michael, special boo. Um, <laughs> you were talking before about George Michael being, bless being him. a boxer. But, you know, no, George Michael wasn't a boxer, was he? No, he's a boxer, yeah. No. Well, he spent years getting whacked around the ring. <laughs> I tell you what, <laughs> you're getting much bigger laughs than Lee Mack, and he's a professional. I don't think, I don't think, I don't <laughs> there think... he is on the right. <laughs> Did you just give Russell Crowe the finger? <laughs> Do you know what you're messing with, Mack? <laughs> hey, Russell's had two children since last time's show. Two, congratulations, Russell's Ooh. a father twice over with his lovely wife Danielle. Congratulations on that. What a nice thing. <laughs> This little boy. It's such a funny thing when you, when you go on shows and they announce that and everybody claps. Just think about it for a minute. <laughs> it's kind of funny. If you're clapping now, you should have been there on the night. There you go. <laughs> hey, you would have been cheering. <laughs> <laughs> Was it that good? <laughs> um, hey, well, we've got a result. How are you finding that, though? How is it being a dad now? Is it what you hoped for? Is it what you expected? It's much more than I ever could have possibly hoped for. Um, the relationships that, that, that is developing with my son Charlie is just ama an amazing thing. How lovely. And I'm looking forward to that happening with my new baby tennis, and it's only 12 weeks at the moment, but uh, already, I mean, look, it's just an incredible thing, and every day it's, it's, it gets more and more fantastic. I took Charlie to Mary Poppins yesterday. So he's over here with you in the UK, yeah? Yep. Wow. Yeah, we're talking to Mary Poppins, and, and you see, he's a big fan of the DVD, right? And when Mary comes out, he goes, That's not Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> But he didn't, do it in a, he didn't do it in a quiet voice. <laughs> you know what I mean? He did it in a very... Good, you know, Where's the animals? You know? And everybody else in the theatre is going, having a look, and I'm going, Bub, Bub, you have to whisper, all right? It's cool, ask me questions and everything, but whisper. And he goes, I can't whisper, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> but when she came off the stage and flew through the air, Man, that was a cool moment. It was a great production, I got to say. It's a great production. Yeah. And how nice for him to remember you took him to see Mary Poppins. Did he remember this trip to London? Hopefully? Yeah, yeah. Well, we took him to The Lion King in New York. Um, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not like au fait with The Lion King story. You're so. not big on the Disney cartoons? Well, no, I watch them all now, but I just hadn't watched that particular cartoon yeah. and didn't know that the dad was going to die. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a oh, horrible thing God. when you watch that with oh, a little oh, boy or girl. God. He's sitting there going, What's happened to the daddy? <laughs> I think he's just having a sleep. Well, somebody should wake him up now. <laughs> I'll go and have a talk to the manager. Yeah. <laughs> See what we can arrange. You're right, that's a whole... I remember now watching yeah. My Little Boy for the first time and he was in tears afterwards. Right, well, he, Charlie got to halfway through The Lion King and he was just like... Ah, ah. 
Uh, well, congratulations, though. Genuine, I mean that. It's such a lovely yeah. thing. Uh, do you, are you going to have any more, do you think? You, you got any more lined up, any more children on the way? Currently in negotiation. Okay. Um, <laughs> I very, you know, I've always had this thing that, uh, in my mind, that I had to have a couple of older brothers in place before I could have a, a daughter. Yep, you know, well, one true. older brother's one thing, you know, and that can solve a certain amount of problems. But if you've got two older brothers, right, nobody is going to mess with you, right? And uh, both Danielle and I definitely want a daughter. So, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, hey, she's the boss. It's all yeah. her call to her. Well, but well, I hope it works out. Congratulations. But how lovely to have two little boys. Cool. Uh, let's talk about the new film out. Is it called The Good Year or A Good Year? A Good Year. Uh, I always look forward to a Russell Crowe movie. I relax when I know you're in a film. And when you're paired with Ridley Scott, who of course may gladiate with you, you know it's going to be an accomplished piece of work. Uh, and it was strange to see you guys working on a comedy. I thought this was, you know, to see you going in a totally different area surprised me a little bit. I don't know why, because there's no reason why you shouldn't be. But is this, is this your first out and out comedy you've made? No, no, no. I've done probably ten. You know, I've played an only re retentive Welsh Baptist virgin in a film called Love and Limbo. I played a, a gay football playing plumber in a film called The Sum of Us. I played an ice skating sheriff in Mystery Alaska. Okay. You know, well, what about in films we might have seen? <laughs> I mean, in film, in film, films that were hits. Well, there was a lot of laughs in Gladiator. <laughs> Glad Gladiator was a great film, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah laugh a minute. Um, no, but it was a great film. The thing about Ridley and working with Ridley is that, you know, actually, he gave a great quote the other day to a magazine. He said, uh, We're both marginally grumpy men. However, our mood considerably lightens in each other's company. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of cancel each other out a bit. Well, it's just, you know, we, we share a lot of common ground. We share a common a aesthetic, a common sense of humour, and a common work ethic, you know. And I know whatever it is that I may invent in the moment, you know, Ridley's got it covered and he's going to capture it. And, man, I mean, what a wonderful privilege for me to work, you know, in this way and have this kind of personal relationship with one of the greatest... Uh, yeah. men to ever work in the cinema. A know? tremendous director. Uh, what's the story behind the, uh, the film? Because uh, didn't he inspire the story? He's, he's friends with the wife and they came up with the idea together, yeah. is that right? Yeah, well, they, they, depending on who you talk to, Peter said it was over a, a lunch and Ridley says it was a New Year's Eve party. So and, and this is Peter Obviously there Peter was alcohol Mayle, involved. It? Yes, Peter Mayle, yeah. who wrote uh, A Year in Provence and Toujours Provence and, uh, and a number of books now set in, in, in that area. And Peter was a high-flying advertising executive and then one day just walked out of his life and ended up in Provence and started writing books. And uh, Ridley, of course, um, 15 years ago, uh, very successful and all that sort of stuff, decided he needed some place to go and run away and hide every now and then, and, and he chose Provence, so he's had a house down there for 15 years. And when we talked through all the possibilities of what we could do together, there was just a little bit of extra sparkle in his eye when he talked about what he call, called the wine project. And so I said to him, well, let's do that one, man. You're obviously really passionate about it, so let's have a bit of fun with that. And you play the guy, you play kind of Peter Mayle's life story in a way. I mean, I know it's not, it's filtered well, through comedy. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not really uh, Peter's life at all. Yeah. But uh, both those guys, both Peter Mayle and Ridley, you know, there are aspects of the character Max. There's an element of wish fulfilment in this, though, that I think most of us respond to. I mean, you're watching a film which a guy gives up the life he's leading and the kind of stresses that go with whatever he's doing, and then goes to France where he, he finds a beautiful place to hang out, and the wine is good, and the food is good, and there's beautiful people. It just seems, it's so idyllic and so seductive. In real life, would you be tempted by that kind of thing? Well, it is a lovely place, but, uh, you know, I have a, a very strong relationship with the Australian bush, and uh, I have a property um, of my own, and when things do get a little hectic and crazy, that's the place that I go to, you know. Is, is the Australian bush a nice place? Yeah, if you, if you accept its dangers and understand them, you know, and you're sensible about it, you know. They have snakes there? Lots. Spiders? Yeah. But look, it's Australia, Jonathan. Everything in Australia bites, especially the girls. <laughs> Did you get a joke book for Christmas or something? <laughs> uh, OK, let's have a look at a clip. This is Russell in action. It's called A Good Year. Have a look at it. <laughs> A good year. It's fun and you're right, it's touching, it's quite moving as well. Uh, what's it like filming in France? What's it like working in France? What's it like working it with was, French people? It was really hard and... Uh, but somebody had to do it. Yeah. In the south somebody of France, Somebody had to go sunshine. to Provence for three months and get paid for it and take their family and I said, well, if, if somebody has to do it, I'll do it. And if I could do it every year for the rest of my life, I would absolutely love it. It's yep. a magnificent place and the area that we shot in is very, very beautiful. It's very intensely farm, but, you know, in a strange way, you, you never even notice because everybody gets about doing things in a very casual and relaxed way. I got on really well with the French. I mean, you know, I'm, for, I'm outside the Anglo-Franco argument, so they yeah, treated me a lot nicer than they... But, you know, when we're over there, we all, I think we like being in France, but there is a weird <coughs> uh, relationship that we have it with French people. It is very weird, yeah. yeah. And especially the muttering under the breath, you know. <laughs> so, like, you talk to, to somebody uh, like Ridley, 
actually, you know. Ridley does it without even thinking, you know, he'll be talking about how beautiful Provence is and then he'll just chuck in some, like, you know, casual abuse about the bloke who lives next door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they can't help being inferior to us uh, and I think there's a lot of jealousy <laughs> that comes from that friction, <laughs> inevitably. It's like you were New Zealanders. Yeah, I am well, You New are Zealander. New Zealand, aren't you? <laughs> Good move, yeah, Johnny. <laughs> you didn't waste any time moving to Australia, though, did you, when you got the chance? <laughs> Uh, OK, let me ask you about your fitness uh, and staying in shape and so on and so forth, because uh, being an actor and being a performer and being in the public eye, uh, sometimes you play parts which demand you to be fit, obviously, uh, but you're kind of being judged on your appearance all the time and, you know, the way you look affects the parts you get. Um, but you, you seem someone who is quite relaxed about that sort of life. I don't get the feeling, and yeah, don't take this wrong way, I don't get the feeling you're a vain man. No. <laughs> Certainly not There's turning no up point. dressed like that for a talk show. <laughs> oh, I just knew some of that. Yes, good. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't really worry about it that much, you know. In fact, I probably should, you know, but I go to the gym and it's about a character. I don't do that for, for my lifestyle. I, I ride a uh, push bike a lot, um, just for my own fun and enjoyment, you know. And when you throw yourself into a park, you know, be it a park you need to get fit for, otherwise, um, do, you, do you seek out the challenges that make you go that extra mile? Because some of the Sometimes. roles I've seen you play, you really, you totally immerse yourself in it, it seems, and you really lose yourself in that. And that must be, I, I guess, part of the appeal. Yeah, it can be. But, you know, uh, it just depends. I mean, if you're going to play a boxer, you know, you've got to do the work with your body in order to achieve that. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're not fulfilling your job. Um, but something like this, something like a good year, there's, there's only th the things that I have to bring to a good year come from inside of it. Yeah, you it's know, the They come from, you know, from knowledge of your own life and stuff and, and, and how things have affected you and points in your own life when you've, you've asked yourself these, these questions as well. If you, if you played a part in which the person had to get grotesquely fat, for example. Well, I put on a lot of weight for the insider. I think I put on like about 60 pounds. Yeah. You know, I got up to about 250 pounds to play Jeffrey Wygant. And I've done that a couple of times. I, you know, put on quite a bit of weight to play, play Jack Aubrey. And just recently on a little uh, independent film called Tenderness as well. Um, but, you know, I'm, and I, I suppose I, I'm used to my body going up and down because of that. I just feel it's just part of your responsibility as an actor, you know. And do you warn your missus in advance? You say, look, you know, I'm going to be chubby for a couple of months. Well, I tell you the opposite of that, right? So I, I met my wife in um, in 1989 on a film called The Crossing, and um, so I'm training in 2004 for Cinderella Man, and um, training very hard. Angelo Dundee was my trainer, you know. And we, He's and the legendary trainer. Yeah, trained yeah, Muhammad Ali, yeah. Ali and, and Sugar Ray and stuff, you know. And um, I had to go over to Toronto about probably six, seven weeks before she came over, and um, when we got to Toronto. The, the workouts just increased massively, you know, probably four or five a day, you know, and when she arrived in Toronto, I was in the shower and uh, I didn't hear her come in. She came into the bathroom and she, go, she goes, oh, haven't seen that ass since 1989. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, are there roles, when you see someone get else getting apart, are there roles where you think, oh, I really wish I'd had the chance to get there? Have there been uh, opportunities that you've missed or have there been parts recently where you think, why don't I get more of that kind of work? I mean... De Niro would be... It pretty much all comes to me first. And I don't say that in a, an arrogant way. It's just the, wow. that's the way the business is. And, How you know, great to be in that position. Though. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, it's also very confusing. And that also is, you know, takes quite a bit of responsibility because you try and read everything that you possibly can. You know? and, um, but you know, some subject matters and stuff just don't interest me in a given time. You know? um, so I just take the thing that you know, is apparent to me in that moment that that's what I want to do. I mean, this wine thing, if you asked me to do this a few years ago, I probably wouldn't have been interested in it. But so this, does it coincide with what's happening in your personal life? Do you think the fact that you've got the family now and then that's... When you, when you have the objectivity a few years later, you can always look back and say, oh, there I was there, and that's why I did that, you yeah. know. But at the time, it's just, you know, what is apparent to you that you can be really passionate about, and that's the key thing. You know, when I turn up to work, I'm not there to earn a dollar. I'm not there to get a pat on the back. I'm there because this role is really exciting for me, you know, and I want to do the things that I need to do for, for that particular role. And I think that's why, you know, I enjoy myself as much as I do, man, because, you know, I only do it if it means something to me. That's a great philosophy, of course. Do you make mistakes, though? Do you find yourself halfway through a movie and thinking, I know why I wanted to do this, but this has turned into a living hell? Less and less as time goes by, but I've had a few of those experiences in the past. And what would you do now, in the position you are now, would you walk from a movie if it was going... Well, that's just not possible, it's not real. You know, once you've agreed to do something, man, you've got to fulfil it, you've got to fulfil your contract. I mean, that's, that's part of it, you know. 
Uh, what, what films do we have looking forward uh, to come from you in the, in the near future? Because I know you've made a couple more. We haven't seen that much of you, um, but I know there's a, a couple more already filmed that are due to come yeah, out. Yeah, Good Year comes out on the 27th of this month, as you said. There's a little film called Tenderness. Uh, and that's I, a low budget film, or a yeah, big that film? was only a small budget. And I, I was only working on it for about nine days. I just play a small character in it. But the guy who directed that is, was uh, is a friend of mine, and, and we made two movies together as, as actors. And so he was doing this, and I said I, I agreed to do it. I just finished my part of American Gangster with Denzel Washington. Now I'm looking forward to this. This sounds pretty, yeah, pretty, it's pretty good. cool. Yeah, pretty cool. You play a cop uh, in the 70s, is that right? Yeah, it's a very odd movie. I mean, again, again it's with Ridley and. Um, yeah, Denzel plays a guy called Frank Lucas, who's a real-life character, who, when he was finally arrested, had $250 million in offshore accounts from selling heroin. Um, uh, Denzel's character, Frank, you know, devised this way in the early 70s to cut out the, the mafia gangs in New York and go straight to a source in Southeast Asia and ship heroin back into America in the coffins of dead U.S. soldiers. And this is a true story? True story. Incredible. And, you know, a lot of cops hundreds of cops stared at this problem for years and just one little piece of luck with the character that I play who is again is a real life character um, actually led to Frank Lucas's downfall but the funny thing about the film is the guy that sells heroin you know lives in a penthouse drives a Lincoln town car has a completely ordered middle-class life has a relationship with Miss Puerto Rico and takes his mum to church every Sunday and the cops that are chasing him are completely dysfunctional their relationships never last. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're just all over the place. And that's sort of, uh, it's when those two worlds collide. Yeah. That's $250 million will help you get your life sorted out of that, though, won't it? If you, yeah, <laughs> even, but you've no got to be pretty well it. sorted to, get, oh, to yeah. start gathering that in the first place. How great is your job? You get to play a cop, and not just any cop, a cop in flares in the 70s. That's got to be a dream gig. <laughs> with my David Cassidy hair. Oh, I can't wait for it. Uh, Russell, I would gladly spend hours talking with you. I know, uh, unfortunately, we don't, because you've got to go, and I, I'm busting for the loo. But, but Russell... <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, it's true. <laughs> you get oh, away, Jonathan. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, Russell, wasn't, wasn't Russell a charming guest to be with us this evening, ladies and gentlemen? What a, what a treat to have you on the show. Thank yeah. you for coming here. Russell Crowe, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. And the movie's great. Thank you, Russell. It's great.